So hi, everybody. Welcome to the, today's panel discussion, uh, diversity in STEM opportunities and challenges um, for undergraduates. Uh, I wanted to begin by introducing each of our panelists and then having them say a quick word about themselves. Um, so I'll begin by introducing Dr. Sharon Milgram, um, who is the director of, of the Office of Intramural Training and Education at the National Institute of Health. Great, thank you uh, for the invitation to be here. I guess I'll focus just not so much on my work and a little bit on my life. So I was a physical therapist before I realized I wanted to go to grad school. I um, am a cell biologist by training. I had a lab uh, for many years um, at first UNC Chapel Hill and then at NIH. And now I direct the Office of Intramural Training and Education. Um, as you heard, I spend a lot of time um, with our postbacs and grad students and postdocs. Um, I'm a mom and a wife. My wife is an artist. My son lives in LA. He talks about Santa Barbara all the time. So uh, hopefully sometime I'll get to uh, watch him skateboard uh, there. That's usually what he goes to do in Santa Barbara. Thank you for the invitation. Hello, everyone. I am very happy to introduce Dr. David Asai, who is the Senior Director for Science Education at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. David's group develops programs that encourage colleges and universities to create inclusive learning environments for undergrads and graduate students. Um, Dr. Asai, would you like to expand a little bit on that? Thanks, Diego. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, well, it's hard to follow Sharon, so she gave you such a great synopsis of her of her background. I'll just say very briefly that um, I uh, grew up in Hawaii, on Maui, and uh, then I came to the mainland for college, graduate school, and I spent um, four years, I guess, at UCSB as a postdoc and then as a sort of a research faculty member. Um, so I have a great attachment to UCSB and, and um, I just have to believe that the scenery out your window is a little bit brighter and uh, less gloomy than it is here in DC. Perfect, thank you, Dr. Asai. And I'm going to say a few words to introduce Dr. Allison Gami. Dr. Allison Gami is the Director of Training, Workforce Development, and Diversity at National Institutes of Health. Allison supports um, a variety of research training from undergraduate level to faculty level and devotes her time to promote inclusive, safe, and supportive research environments for researchers at different levels. Um, Dr. Gami, would you like to say a few words about yourself? Sure, and, and thanks so much for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, Let's see, I don't know how far back to go, but I grew up in Oklahoma, which not many people, <laughs> I don't know, I, people always say, oh, I've never met anybody from Oklahoma. So, um, and uh, let's see, before coming to NIH, I was at um, Princeton for, I think about 22, 23 years. And I started out as a postdoc, moved on to um, lecture, then senior lecture. I had a lab, I taught, um, and I uh, ran diversity program, summer program for students, um, also for um, graduate students. And so um, I, I, my great love is um, actually science teaching and mentoring. Um, and it was because of that and because of the challenges that I saw that my students faced that I really wanted to take this position. And so now I'm at a job where I don't get to interact with students on a daily basis, except for the ones that I mentored before. Um, but um, I'm, I'm really trying to to be where I am to make a difference for you and for the next generation. Um, I think that there's a lot of changes that need to be made in the biomedical research enterprise um, to be more inclusive. And um, really one of the ways to bring, obviously one of the ways to bring about change is to be part of the funding agencies and to exert pressure on institutions to bring about these changes. And so that was my reason for leaving kind of my great love, <laughs> which is um, teaching and mentoring and doing science so that I could um, try at least in some small way help the next generation. Thank you, Dr. Gammy. 
Um, I will now introduce Dr. Evelyn Ehrenrich, and she is the Associate Dean and Chief Diversity Officer at Rutgers University School of Graduate Studies. Um, Dr. Ehrenrich, is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, sure, and thank you also for the invitation. This is really a pleasure. Um, let me briefly go back to the time when I was probably the age of the students that are here today. And that was a while ago. So I was a science education major. And this was so long ago that I assumed as a girl interested in science, I had two career paths, either be a nurse or a high school teacher. Um, and what really changed my trajectory was a summer research internship between my junior and senior year. So I didn't have the opportunity to do research as an undergraduate. Um, it just basically wasn't available. And um, said, wow, this research stuff is actually kind of fun. So I went back to, I was a chemistry major and well, actually I wasn't, I was, let me think, I was a science education major and I went back my senior year I made an appointment with the dean and said you know I really like research and I think I might want to go to graduate school so can I change my program instead of doing student teaching for my senior fall I want to take physical chemistry so I can you know apply to a PhD program in chemistry and he said I've been dean for this was at Cornell I said he said I've been dean for 30 years um, I have never yet had a student come into my office who wanted to get into PCHEM. I've had many come in who want to get out of it. So yes, it's a go. And from there, I did go on and get my PhD. I've done a lot of different things with that, which actually I found very exciting. I started out working in industry as a research scientist. Um, I moved into commercial development, which sort of like what a startup would be today. And it meant going out and talking to customers about their needs and how our science and technology could meet those needs. Um, from there, I went back into the academic arena. I was a teaching professor in the chemistry department at Rutgers, where I developed programs to help students who are having trouble move on in science. And you know, when I step back to look at who that population was, it was a lot of students from underserved high schools. So it, that's sort of how I got into the area of what we call broadening participation in STEM. And from there, I ultimately moved to the School of Graduate Studies where I sort of ramped up that kind of pathway or stepping stone type of program from the undergraduate to graduate level. So that's pretty much what I've been doing uh, for the last almost 20 years. Um, it includes you know, summer research programs, developing programs for graduate students to promote their success, uh, mentoring programs, which we've developed through the National Research Mentoring Network. So we shout out to NIH for developing those programs. And um, yeah, so many different things. Be happy to talk more about them later. Thank you, Dr. Aaron Rich. That was very informative. Um, so now we're gonna move on to our plan questions. So to begin, how have you seen COVID impact undergraduate, prospective graduate and graduate students, particularly underrepresented students? Do you have any sense for how this has impacted the admissions process and concerns during admissions for current research and graduate program applications? I mean, I could start, but if someone else wants to, uh, okay. Um, you know, I think, I mean, obviously we've all seen uh, a major life change in the last two years, uh, some of us more than others. And for many people, this has been very negative experience, but not to minimize that, but I think there've been negatives and positives when we look at this from the sphere of universities, graduate admissions. Um, certainly, you know, students, both undergraduate and graduate have been dealing with enormous stuff on their plates that no one would have envisioned. You know, certainly illness, family issues, uh, economic impact, and just the uncertainty of what lies ahead. Um, you know, mental health has been an area at the forefront of 
much of our planning and, and programming we've developed at Rutgers for graduate students, but certainly on the national, it's a big area of national concern, you know, mental health for graduate students. We have you know, also implemented what we call wellness workshops into our uh, summer undergraduate programs. We did that when we went to a remote program in the summer of 2020. Um, just to help students deal with the lack of community that we normally have in a residential program. And students found the wellness workshop so valuable that now that we're going back to an in-person program in this summer, we think uh, we're planning it, um, you know, we're going to have continue these wellness workshops. So I think, you know, that is a positive to come out of this that there is more recognition of the importance of the whole person and the mental and emotional health of everybody, all, you know, students, faculty, staff, that was probably less on the table before. Um, you know, another problem we've seen, it has been, we talked about this a little bit even before we officially started this, this session, was internet access, it's sometimes spotty, and people working from home, students particularly often had and still continue to have access issues. Um, so, you know, on the positive though, we've tried to address that and looked at how we can make virtual world more accessible universally. An, an part of the admissions process, which has changed considerably over the last two years are programs, graduate program requirements for GREs. I mean, the GRE requirement was, so the biomedical sciences and, and life sciences became GRE blind, at least at Rutgers and many other programs across the country pre-COVID, but that has now expanded to more and more programs, just, and part of that was because of access so programs that were staunchly saying in 2019, you know, we're never going to waive GREs uh, with the start of the pandemic, stepped back and took a look at this. And I think that's a real game changer, particularly for students from diverse backgrounds. So those are some of the main points that come to mind. Um, let me turn this over to the other panelists and we can see what else they are thinking. Um, I'll add uh, something that I think um, we all have to be thinking about pretty hard for the next few years, and that is position numbers have decreased dramatically for summer programs, uh, the number of student interns at NIH, we still have a freeze on school year uh, special volunteers because we're trying to keep our density low and uh, uh, you know, one way to do that is to say, well, let's not have people coming and going uh, for a couple of hours here and there. I think that all of you use those experiences in your applications. You talk about, right, one small experience leads to a next experience and a next experience, and one day you find yourself in the grad school you want to be at. So I think we all need to be very cognizant of, of that very tangible um, impact. The flip side, maybe the world is smaller and when you look at graduate schools, you will be able to look at many, many more schools because there will be virtual pre-visits and you might be surprised that there's a school you would have never gotten on a plane and went to that you'll now take an opportunity uh, to look at. For example, in our grad fair, which will be remote for the third summer, it breaks my heart. The first summer we say, oh, it's a one-time thing. You know, we have 350 schools registered. And we used to have 100 show up in person and somebody at a grad program at UCSB or at Rutgers or somewhere else couldn't come. And now they can come virtually. So maybe one loss of opportunities, you know, there's a gain of a chance to look. I will want to mention one other thing. I'm curious to see what other people think about this. 
our PIs who are hiring postbacs, and we have the largest postback program in the country. We actually top 1,200 now, which uh, is, is quite a large program. Our postbacs are, have started after a long time in the virtual space, and our PIs are saying that there are some skills that are rusty. Now, there are some skills on our PIs parts that are rusty too, um, but they've noted that, well, these, this is a group that hasn't had jobs and been as used to showing up on time, uh, that uh, Zoom can give this sense of, oh, I don't need to prepare, I can just hit launch. And so I think a, another thing for you all to think about as we hopefully emerge from this to more in person is um, that some culture has changed in the last two years. Some of that will be forever changed. Some of that we will attempt to be reverting back. And I think there's gonna be some adjustments for both PIs and grad program directors and students as well to what is the new norm um, of how to, um, to deal. And thank you uh, for remembering, I, I apologize, PI, you know, the faculty members that you work with. So uh, I guess those are a few things that I've been thinking about uh, as uh, I've been watching us all attempt to get back to a new normal. David, do you wanna go next or? Okay. <laughs> um, so, so many great things have been said. It's really hard for me to um, say too much more, but one of the one of the hopes at least that I have had is that um, we will all take a moment to uh, look at the structure specifically of admissions and say, um, you know, everything that we thought had to be true. We had to look at grades. We had to look at, G, you know, all of these things that we are using as metrics for entry into either undergrad or grad. Um, we just do a rethink on all of that. Um, when we talk about structural racism and discrimination, um, it's, it's not necessarily um, these, it's really these kind of mundane things like the admissions process. And so we, it gives us a moment to say, you know, we thought the GRE was the equalizer, that it would tell us people from different schools that you know, that what their abilities are, but then we learned later that these tests, in fact, are um, skewed towards well-represented men in particular, or, or people who are affluent. So um, I, I think that my hope is that we, we just take a step back and we are a little bit humble about the way admissions has been done in the past and say, you know, what really are some measures um, that we can look at. One of the worries is, and, and Sharon really mentioned this, is that we did, we did, we were seeing some movements towards saying, okay, research experiences. Is some, does somebody have the fire in the belly? Do they love research? And it's okay. Well, now <laughs> we've had two years of not no access to research. So, how how do you know if you if you have a passion for it or a love for it? So it it again, it's it's going to be complicated, but. Um, we, you know, I, I hope we, we take up the challenge and we decide that this is a great opportunity to build it over again because the previous system really was not working well um, for, for bringing in the entire group of people in that we need, we desperately need in the biomedical uh, research workforce. Yeah, you know, I, I don't have anything to add, so I, I really appreciate what what my colleagues have already said. I would just emphasize what Allison just said, which is that if we don't get better coming out of this, then we, we will have lost an opportunity. And certainly one of those aspects of getting better is thinking about what really um, prepares a person for graduate school and how a graduate school should be selecting its, its folks. And I, I see that there, there is a question here about you know, getting a research experience if, if you're not in a post -back program or you haven't been an REU. You know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's probably worth graduate schools to even be thinking again about whether or not a research experience is, the, is as meaningful as we used to think it is. So the, the, 
the, the important aspect of a research experience is that you've actually lived it, you've done it for, you know, you're, you're in it every day, you, you, you're really engaged in it. So, you, so the question is, do I like this or not, right? And that's really important. So I'm not discounting that at all. Uh, but how we define what a research experience is, I think there's an opportunity here for us to rethink some of that. Uh, and it, it need not be the individual person, um, uh, you know, uh, attached to an advisor uh, learning how to do a particular technique. There may be other, other ways of defining authentic research experiences. So it's, I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a great opportunity for the, for the future. And, and we just have to figure it out. If it's okay, I want to make a comment about the NIH postback program. Since we have a lot of positions, there's rolling admissions. We welcome students who are interested in research careers, medical careers, healthcare. 30% um, change their mind in the two years, and we are uh, happy to uh, provide all the support for that to happen. You met me here today. I know it's not a real in-person meeting, but here we are. My uh, email I'm going to put into the chat. There is a video that's on our website that talks about how to get in. People who ask us questions, who email, who bother, bother us. And I say that in air quotes because we invite you to email us. Um, do much better. So don't think this program's not for me. Don't think I won't get in. Think I know Sharon and she will read my essay and give me feedback. So please reach out. I think the prep programs that NIGMS fund are amazing. The postback program at NIH is another opportunity. Please don't think these programs aren't for you. Thank you, everyone, for all of your great answers. Um, I'd like to move on to the next question. So how do you think diversity issues have changed or improved over time from your experiences as an undergraduate? How has the push for diversity changed graduate training opportunities? And how have underrepresented students been able to approach this change? Well, I think... It Probably the, we all have lots of different thoughts. The first thing that I would like to say is this growing appreciation of how complex all of our identities are. And that while there might be rules about who's eligible for this program or that specific program, that in general, we need to keep asking what makes our space the most welcoming it can be around race, ethnicity, gender, um, hidden disabilities, uh, gender identity, everything, just a much broader appreciation that we bring our whole self to work and that our programs need to welcome people to do the same. And for me, that's been one of the key things in expanding the discussion about making sure science is serving everyone, uh, being done by everyone, seeing everyone. Um, you know, when I started doing this kind of work, I ran summer programs at UNC in the 1990s, and we had such a narrow definition of what a diverse community would look like. I think for me personally, another thing um, that has uh, for me really uh, changed how I think about diversity programs um, is uh, how much we use the word should post back should know this, graduate students should be able to do this. This like total lack of appreciation that what happened in your past stops the day you, know, you get in. And I think many, many of us are starting to see that our job is to open the doors and to develop talent, not, not to set a bar. And I think that change in mindset does drive uh, a lot of PIs and uh, faculty, program directors, NIH staff, HHMI staff, university staff, that we really see ourselves now sort of as your partner in cultivating your success, not so much us knowing the answer and, and saying here, uh, read our recipe book. And it's a mindset shift.
I'll just, you know, echo much of what was said in that, you know, I told you, I, I, I started out on my journey back in the dark ages when I thought I could, you know, be a nurse or a high school teacher and that was it. But at that point, when people talked about diversity, you know, suddenly it was opportunities for women in STEM. So I do feel very passionately about that, but, you know, that was the focus uh, and there was no recognition early on, this is before your students were even born, that, well, you know, there are other groups that need to be represented as well. It's not just gender equality. So that's, you know, that whole experience I had uh, as in my transition from undergraduate to graduate school and then graduate school to career, where I feel doors did open up for me because people suddenly realized that women need these opportunities and women who have young families need to have recognition of their needs. And that's all still true, but our concept of, you know, as I said, we call broadening participation is indeed much broader now than it was several decades ago. And, you know, that is a good thing and I think it, it emphasizes what Sharon said about recognizing many identities and the ne needs of, you know, diversity is by itself diverse, right? So we have to think very broadly about creating opportunities for people who might not otherwise have them. David, do you want to go? I, I feel like, do you want to go before I go? I have a personal story I want to tell. So, Allison, you better, you better go first because I'm going to probably take this to a wrong place. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Well, um, Sharon and Evelyn did a great job um, of, I, I think, echoing my, my feelings, which is that back in my day, it was about women, you know, the lack of women, um, much less uh, anybody from any other <laughs> racial ethnic group that's underrepresented. So that, that is a huge change. Um, I think that one of the things that I have found encouraging over time is that there was a period of time when we started to have discussions around diversity. It was really about numbers and, and programs were very focused on numbers and this and that, and we have this in our admissions and that. Um, and then, it was clear that it's not just about numbers. You have to think about inclusivity and retention and taking care of those that you bring into programs. And so that I sort of um, started to enter into the picture to a certain extent. Um, now, I think that the, the, the thing that I'm also wel welcoming in the conversation is equity, which I, I think had, hadn't been um, discussed for quite a few years as well, is there was this sense as, as um, Sharon said, the should, well, they just don't have the background or these other kinds of um, issues. And it's, <laughs> well, <laughs> our job is to teach. Our job is to mentor. You know, we're, we have this group of amazing people. We should help them um, while they're here. Let's forget about the past and um, let's take them to uh, a new place. So um, equity started to be part of it as well. The other thing that I think I'm very encouraged by, there was a while there where you could convince people on a social justice, in the social justice space and say, it's just fair. You know, you out of fairness, you should have increased diversity. But it was always, it, there was always this um, uncomfortable space of where people would still say that that somehow excellence, they would start using words like excellence and other such things that always made me very uncomfortable. Um, and now finally, and I think this actually is coming from the business world in some ways, people are, are appreciating that you can't have excellence in science without diversity, that, there, that it really is essential to moving forward and pushing the boundaries forward as, as far as you can go, it, it really depends on diversity that you can't have it otherwise. And, you know, there's lots of nice data coming out of business where they show that people with, you know, boards that have um, diverse boards perform better and all that sorts of things. So they have sort of data that shows this and it's finally, finally moving into, I think the scientific realm where there's 
a recognition that homogeneity and homogeneity of thought or of, or of um, where, what school you went to and how you think is really not a positive thing. So I think that there are, there just are, there are things that are happening in the space. There is progress. It's happened in, in our lifetimes. Um, and, and I think that we just have to be encouraged that it's going to get better and better. And, and I have to say that some quantum thing happened with George Floyd. Um, people who were previously kind of resistant, some of them, you know, something happened and it, and it really shook them up. So I think we just have to all keep doing the work and be there and be ready for when other people are ready to, you know, take that jump. And, um, but, but I think everybody should be encouraged. There's progress, things are happening. Um, that doesn't mean we have, we can let up, but we have to, we just, we have to keep pushing, but, but there's definitely been progress. Certainly in my, my time in the business have been a big change. So David. <laughs> Well, you said some great stuff there, Allison. So now I feel like I should, but now I'm going to stick to my story and maybe, maybe <laughs> the other stuff will come up later. So this goes way. So the question, I'm going to, coming back to Diego's question. Um, so I was an undergraduate at Stanford many years ago. And in my senior year at Stanford, um, the university decided that they were going to change the financial aid package for black students. So up until then, black students, because the university wanted more black students at Stanford, the university had a, a, uh, a better financial aid package for African-Americans that had less work, study, and more uh, gift aid. And that's a version of equity, right? Because the, the, the sense was instead of treating everybody the same, there might be some populations because of where they come from that would benefit more from less, less having to work and more you know, gift aid. We can debate that or whatever, but this caused a real furor on campus. And so the African-American students, of course, objected. But what was really cool when I was a, being a student there was that the rest of us also joined in. And so the Asian-American groups joined in, the Chicano groups joined in, the Native American groups joined in, and, the, and white students joined us. And we formed something called Students for Equity. And so Students for Equity, we marched, we shut down the buildings, we did all that kind of stuff that you could do back then. And we were able to reverse the university's financial aid. So the thing that I learned from that was that we're all in it together. That it isn't simply one particular ethnic group or one race that has to stand alone, that we should all stand together. White, Black, African-American, Asian American, Latino, Native American, and so forth. And, and that was really powerful for me to understand as a student. And I raise this with you now because I am Asian, I identify as an Asian American. And one of the things that you probably are familiar with is that there is now two affirmative action cases in terms of college admissions that are coming before the Supreme Court. One is at the at, 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 at Harvard and one is at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. These are both being brought, the plaintiffs in both of these cases is an organization called the Students for Fair Admissions. Students for Fair Admissions is actually just a front for a guy named Ed Blum. Ed Blum is a white guy who, who's, whose mission in life is to basically ex exclude uh, some people because he doesn't feel that they belong. He was responsible for gutting the, the, the Voting Rights Act a, a few years ago, for example. Anyway, Students for Fair Admissions is putatively an Asian American group who are claiming that they are being discriminated against because they're Asian American, because other students of color are getting into Harvard or North Carolina. Now, a lot of Asian American groups have, have stood to, on the other side and have said, no, this is not true. We all stand together. So I'm just telling you this, and I invite you to go and read about this some more if you're not familiar with these cases, because I take this very personally. I take this personally because of my time as an undergraduate that I don't believe that one ethnic group should be pitted or against the other, that we should not be made mascots of Edward Blum so that he can win a lawsuit against these universities. And the other thing I'll remind you 
if you read the, the actual uh, uh, arguments, in both cases, and this also occurred in the Fisher cases, the Fish, both Fisher cases in, in Texas and, and other affirmative action cases, there's a, a, a concept that continues to come back, which has to do, which is called mismatch. And so the theory of mismatch has been cited over and over again by the plaintiffs that says that it is actually for their protection that we should not allow a black student or a brown student to come into this university if their test scores are too low. Because the argument is that you get an SAT score, a GRE score, and that that somehow measures your ability and that it is immutable, you can't change it. Well, that's all false. SAT GRE scores are basically measures of your family income and not your ability to be successful. But if we believe that this test score somehow is, is just the prediction of my future, then it is, the argument goes in, it is not fair to a person with a lower test score to come into a place where they will compete with a person with a higher test score because they will fail. And so for their own protection, we're gonna keep the black and brown students out. That is offensive, it is wrong, and as scientists, we should understand that there are data which show that this is just not true. And yet, if, if you read the cases, even for North Carolina and for Harvard, the two cases that are now before the Supreme Court, this mismatch idea continues to be used, and some of the justices pick up on this. And so they say, yeah, we want to protect the people. It's, it's for their own good that we won't let them in. That is so wrong. And if we care about diversity and inclusion in science or in any other field, it's so important that everybody has a chance to come into our schools, whether it's at the undergraduate or graduate level, and prove their ability more than just their test scores that, on, that they took on some Saturday. And it's, it's, you can tell I'm very passionate about this, but this is something that you folks, all of all the names that I'm seeing on my TV screen here, this is your battle because the wedge issues are being driven between us right now. And I, I really encourage you to read up on those cases and have an opinion and talk about it and really see and follow these cases. They're both gonna come in before the court next, uh, next year. Um, and it's, it's, it's really important if we care about, if we care at all about changing the face of, 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 of science, for example. So I'll, I will stop there. I'm, I'm sorry to go on about that. But. Thank you, Dr. Yusai, that was really powerful. Um, I'd also like to thank you for bringing up those two current cases that are going on. Uh, I knew that they were coming up, but I didn't really know that they were funded by this man, um, Blum. So uh, it, it was very informative, thank you. Um, moving on to our next question. What particular issues regarding diversity, equity, and inclusion are affecting the programs you're from? And what particular DEI issues are your institutions most concerned about? And what are they trying to do to address these issues? I, I imagine you could come at that from a lot of different ways. I think that we are uh, within the intramural program and within our training uh, programs, um, trying to uh, remember that recruitment is one thing, but support and retention is uh, really a key place. And I think that, um, we appreciate that we perhaps need to uh, spend a lot more time thinking about changes in that realm. So providing much more training for PIs and we're partway through a series of, of uh, workshops for PIs uh, with hundreds of people participating, small group discussions, lots of sharing of ideas, realizing that uh, until research groups are welcoming, no amount of recruitment will change uh, the future trajectory. I think from the perspective of trainees appreciating that community, that uh, training 
uh, on that side for how to be in really diverse groups, how to um, take care of yourself, the link between trainee harassment within research groups and health and mental health concerns has been clearly shown. And so teaching people um, about how to take good care and how to find welcoming and affirming environments. The honest truth is it should be every environment is welcoming and affirming, but we know they're not. So we have to deal with that immediate reality while working to change it. And so for us, I think we are putting much more of our thought and energy saying, okay, recruitment, one thing, but now let's really cultivate, nurture, support, listen to the group that we've recruited. And I, I think that for me, that has been a big part of the evolution of our programs. Yeah, I think, you know, we've seen that at the university institutional level as well. So we have always gone through and this transcends universities, you know, businesses every five years, there's a strategic plan and the old plan goes out and the new one takes a lot of work to develop. Um, this past year, um, year and a half is the first time the university has had a systemic um, DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion strategic plan. And each unit was charged by unit, I mean each school, be it School of Arts and Sciences, School of Environmental and Biological Sciences, graduate school and so on. Um, each unit needed to come up with its own diversity, equity and inclusion strategic plan, which then was coordinated with the university wide plan. And that's been a very uh, interesting and informative process. And you know what's come out of that I've, I've seen echoing much of what Sharon just said, and it's uh, thinking about programs to support students and what we call the student experience. I mean, that was not formally on the forefront of the agenda of programs, departments, and units or schools. So, you know, I think that means that our concept of what's important in creating an affirming and supportive environment that will promote success is growing and deepening and broadening. I think, you know, we're seeing this um, certainly very widely. Um, also the mentoring programs, um, again, that Sharon mentioned. And as I said before, NIH has really been in, in the forefront in developing the National Research Mentoring Network um, through which there are modules that institutions and departments can adopt for their own mentoring, both to train faculty to be more supportive mentors and culturally aware mentors and to train students to be more effective mentees, which is what we call mentoring up. So this is really a bi-directional program, bi-directional and multi-tiered. You know, at each level, you can be either a mentee or a mentor. Even as an undergraduate, which many of you here are, you know, you may think of, well, I'm a mentee if you are doing research or if you have someone who you view as your mentor, but you could be working with a first year student or a high school student who's coming to you for advice and in that sense, you are a mentor. So, you know, there are ways you can be trained to be a more culturally aware mentor, as well as a more effective me mentee who will advocate for, for yourself. Okay, I'll go next. Um, so it was mentioned at the beginning that I, um, our division administers programs that are across the, um, the pathway starting community college level up to the faculty level. And um, some of these are institutional awards where the money is given at, at, to the institution and we're at about 300 different institutions in the country. It's about um, somewhere between 350 to $400 million a year at these different institutions. 
And um, I think what we're really trying to think about now is, you know, we have these, these great programs and they're run by amazing, dedicated, passionate people. But if we really wanna bring about change, we have to change the institutions. Um, that you can have a beautiful bubble where, where students get support and they get mentoring and they get, but um, as soon as they step outside of that bubble, then they're in a hostile environment. That is just not, <laughs> that's not gonna bring about um, sustained change. And so the real question is how do you leverage with these training awards? How do you really try to um, incentivize change in the DEIA space. And so what we've started to do, um, starting back in 2017, we have an institutional letter that needs to detail the ways in which the institution is supportive of the program and supportive of issues around DEIA. Um, we have in our funding announcements that there needs to be mentor training there needs to be oversight of the mentor mentee match to make sure that all is well, there needs to be um, procedures in place to remove individuals who have proven not to be, um, um, I don't know how to say it, but basically not showing poor mentorship qualities. Um, and so there are things that we can do to say, you know, you need to have these in your program, you need to focus on the student and what the student needs and the skills that they need to transition to the next stage um, in their career pathway. And you need to let them know what those career paths are. Um, so these are all part of effective programs. And what we really, really want to do is to get a shift in the culture such that, that research is not the only thing that is incentivized at the institutional level. So research productivity through papers and grants and other such things, because if that's the only thing that's incentivized, then you start to use students as labor, inexpensive labor, you know, this amazing resource of talent and creativity um, that is being used for, for, for research. And if you don't take care of the students, then you've got a serious problem on your hands. So you just trying to shift the culture and to bring it back to the student. These are institutions of higher learning. It's supposed to be about the students. It's supposed to be about the trainees. And research, yes, is wonderful because that makes a, 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 you know, a great learning environment potentially, but you can't sacrifice the students for the research. Um, and so we just have to shift things back and we have to find ways to incentivize that. So. That's what we're working on in our funding announcements. It's part of the scored review criteria. The reviewers are starting to take this very seriously and big grants at, um, at prominent places are going down if they're not paying attention to these things. So um, I think that, that that's, that's where we are. Um, and and I, I do wanna end by saying there really are amazing people out there who run our programs and I just wanna thank them if any of them are on the call or if any of you are in those programs, I think they're doing wonderful things but they need help. They need institutional help and support as well. Yeah, I'll just add that what GM, what NIGMS is doing uh, under Allison's leadership is, is really important and, and I admire it very much. Last October, so it's about uh, what, six months ago now, HHMI announced our DEI goals. And it's, it's, uh, they're on our website if you want to take a look. And as we were developing those goals, um, at first we started just where Allison was talking about a few minutes ago, which is that we just looked at the numbers. We just said, we just wanna see more diversity. We wanna see more persons of color. We wanna see more women in science. That's actually the easy stuff. It's easy to buy diversity. If you just wanna spend money, that's what we are a funder. You can hire people and, and, and you, can, you can change the, the phenotype of, of the group. That doesn't mean though that they that they will be successful, nor does it mean that they will want to be, to, to to remain. And so, as our DEI goals evolved, as we were developing them over about a year and a half before we announced them publicly, uh, what I'm really proud of is that we paid just as much attention to the environment in which persons find themselves. And so, it isn't sufficient 
to hire a person or to have another graduate student or persons, persons from uh, groups that are underrepresented in science. It is also equally important to create an environment in which they are learning, in which they are being trained, that is inclusive. And inclusion means it's not a number, right? Diversity is a number. You can measure the diversity of a group. Inclusion is a feeling. How do you feel? Do you feel that you belong? Do you feel that the system actually expects you to be successful? And that's harder, but that's something that you ha we have to do if we're going to see lasting change um, in, in terms of diversity. So um, that's, uh, that's been very gratifying for me to see in my own or organization in terms of, the, I think, the sort of the, the, the change that we're, we're trying to we're trying to grapple with. It's hard, and it's hard for an organization like HHMI to get away from just saying, well, you know, we know, we know we're excellent, we know we're great, why do we have to change? Uh, the word rigor came up in the chat earlier, you know, we want to be rigorous, and if we add diversity, then won't that take away from our rigor? Uh, boy, diversity is fine, but if we do diversity, then we're also going to erode our, our, our excellence. So that mindset, that's culture, right? That's the environment. And that has to change. And you can't buy that change. What you have to do is you have to incentivize it and you have to make it so that the people who are in science understand that there's a different way of thinking about how, um, how we should behave and, and, and what our structures are. So that's the, to me, that's the, that's the big challenge and also the most exciting part of this work. Okay, um, I think we also had a couple of student submitted questions. Do we want to move on to those now? Yeah, we can okay. move on to those now. Um, and I would actually like to pull a question from the chat if that is okay. Um, okay. Lindsay asked, as someone who's thinking about graduate school, how would you approach finding good mentors and emphasizing um, good mentorship? I feel like I've started first a lot. That's a, okay. Um, you know, I, I, I am not a really big fan of people choosing a graduate program based on individual PIs. I'm a fan of people choosing a graduate program that is supportive, that has a lot of structure, where they've demonstrated excellence uh, through competition for training grants, through showing trajectories for students, through being very open about career outcomes, through embracing diversity of career outcomes. There's not just diversity of people. There's uh, being, being um, open to all career outcomes, celebrating all career outcomes, and the way you find programs that are welcoming and, and, and sort of walking the walk and talking the talk is to ask what structured programs they have in place, asking individual students uh, what makes you feel welcome here and what makes you feel unwelcome here. And when you want to change something, who listens and who doesn't listen? Um, what happens when a student is struggling? What happens when a student needs a health leave or a mental health leave? You ask questions that are much more focused on what is the culture like here? Do they want culture change or do they think that the system arranged decades, hundreds of years, not decades ago, for one small, very privileged part of society still works? When you find a place like that, there are mentors who embrace that concept because they've helped build the concept. So I guess if I, you know, with my own postbacs when I had my lab, I would really stress, please don't pick based on science, please pick based on culture. And I know it's hard to hear that because you've heard so much, there's a best place to do science, but there isn't. And people can beat the love of science out of you. And so wouldn't it be better to be at a place where you're being nurtured than where you're being tormented? So that would be my philosophy there. Uh, 
um, you know, we always tell prospective students when they ask similar questions is you need to talk to the students in the school, not just the faculty. Um, talk to graduate students and ask them many of the questions that you know Sharon already put on the table, like what makes you feel welcome, unwelcome, what types of support are available, and get a sense of you know what I referred to broadly before as the student experience. What is that really like? Um, you really, I think, can get a better sense by talking to students, but not one. You know, it's got to be some sort of reasonable statistical sample in order to get a, a, a real sense. That may be harder to do in the virtual environment. You know, when you go for a campus visit for two days and you're hanging out with students in the evening, um, dinner and thereafter, uh, it's a little easier. So, you know, maybe set up, if, if you're not in the situation where you're actually going on physical visits, which may continue indefinitely because, you know, it is a lot less expensive and a lot more convenient, takes less of your time, um, but you may be able to set one-on-one -on -one Zoom sessions up with a few graduate students and just chat. Uh, they may offer or you may take need to take the initiative and usually people like talking about themselves, you know, so phrase it in. I'd like to learn more about your experience and what made you interested in pursuing this pathway. Just see where it goes. And if one doesn't respond, try somebody else. Same with faculty, you know, they don't all respond equally. We as faculty or administrators, you know, we have the same issue. Not every email gets answered the first time, right? Am I alone in that or do others find that as well? So either send a follow-up or try someone else. Don't give up. I think that's all, all of that is really great advice. And the only thing I would add to that is just to do um, some self-reflection too and, and to ask yourself what you need from an advisor, you know yourself better than anybody and you know whether, um, do you need somebody who's going to be a cheerleader? Do you need somebody who's going to have a pretty strong critical facility? Do you need somebody who gives you a little push? Do you need somebody who leaves you alone? Do you, you know, there's all, there are all kinds of things that somebody can be an amazing mentor for one person and really not an amazing mentor for another person because of these personality things. Some people check in all the time and it drives other, it drives the student crazy. Um, but somebody else loves that, that they get, you know, they check in every day. They don't have to be the one to go into the, um, into the principal investigator's office to find them. So really think about who you are and what you need from that mentoring relationship and try to find a good fit for that. Um, and also, um, so when you're talking to people, take it with a grain of salt because they're their own person with their own needs and um, they may have a, a different experience than you might have. I mean, obviously you steer clear of those people who are you know, terrifying and <laughs> clearly not good mentors. But if you really wanna kind of take it to the next level, you really think hard about who you are and, and, and what you wanna get out of the relationship. I would just remind you all that they're recruiting you. And so you have the chance to interview them and you should be asking exactly what has already been said. You fear, figure out what's important to you and then ask. So what, how, what is the evidence that you, that you know how to mentor people from my background? Show me the numbers. Tell me who's been through here that's been successful. What sort of mentorship training have you done as a, as a faculty member or as a department? What's the evidence? Um, do you have a training grant? If you have a training grant, what sort of requirements do they have of the preceptors, of the advisors, right? Um, uh, how, how do you promote people here? Is it just faculty promotion? Is it just based on the number of papers that they have? Or do they also pay attention to how well you teach or how well you mentor students? You can ask these kinds of questions. You can ask for the numbers. How many persons, you know, if, if you cared about how many people from Hawaii, they, they've, they've uh, already, you know, I could ask, well, so how many people from Maui have already gotten a PhD from here? Am I the first? 
is that any different for you, for, for me than for other people? And so, you, you know, you can ask these questions in a, in a, you know, in a, in a respectful way. And if they can't answer the questions, then that should be telling you something. Thank you, um, Dr. Sai, for your very thoughtful question, or sorry, thoughtful answer to the question. Um, I wanted to thank all of our panelists for giving such um, well-rounded and um, uh, thoughtful answers through the course of this panel. And I wanted to end the Zoom now since um, we're a little over past over two and I wanted to respect everyone's time. So I wanted to end by thanking all the panelists for taking time out of their busy schedules um, to come speak to us about their perspectives on how to, um, how to approach um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, and how this has changed over time in academia. I also wanted to thank all the audience members for taking time out of their day to attend this panel discussion. So thank you, everyone. I hope um, you guys all got something out of the panel, and I hope you guys have a good day. Thank you all. Take good care. Stay safe. Thank, thank you. Sir. Thank you. Thank, thank you for the chance to talk to all of you. Yeah.